mics this time? We don't worry about we don't worry about the politically incorrect stuff. We just we just pull out the phone. Right. <laughs> we just start with blaze of glory and go out here. Like I say, what an intro, right? Fist frightened, running, and raping. <laughs> and I, I think I speak for everyone here. It's great to have Gary back at Wasteland. Well, let me ask you the first question. How's your health? Good. Good. Everything's good. going good now? Everything's going well. Thank hey. you. Hey. And uh, you're also... Uh, as we speak, uh, the East Coast Horror Group guys are back there shooting this. Uh, they're going to be. This is going to be actually going to be used as an extra on a documentary called "Love and Other Stunts," I believe. Love and Other Stunts, right? At, uh, there's Joe uh, O'Connell, I believe. Joe O'Connell's doing a documentary on me. Why? Who the hell knows? I have no idea. But he's doing it anyway. Well, you're an icon. That's why. I mean, you know. We've had you on my show, you're like a regular guest, and you know, every time you're on my show, uh, we pop, I think the last time was we had over 6,000 listeners on a Saturday night, which is incredible for an internet radio show, but just shows the draw that Gary has, you know, uh, for all of us Grindhouse fans. And how, how many people here haven't read the book? Gary's book? Yeah. Have not? Have not. Have not. Well, I picked it up. Sadly, he sold out of it. He sold out of it. So the, you guys that did, didn't read it, you have to leave the room now because it's not for you. <laughs> all, all I can say is if there's one book you have to read about film, it's Gary's book. If any of you want it, um, actually, it sold out last night. I had no idea it goes so fast. But if you want it, I have a card at my desk out in the uh, lobby, I mean in the room. And on it, it has my website. You can just email me there. And I'll make sure you get a copy, signed copy, right away. But thank you, Pete. Yeah, it's well received. It's it's getting good, good attention. Yeah, I was flattered because you asked. Said, I have a man. I don't have the book. I have a, the manuscript. I know. He said to me, and then you know, and asked me to write. So when you open the book, there's a nice quote by me in it. So by Mr. Cash. Yeah, thank you. I'm flattered that you asked me, and, and then of course, you, what did you tell me? I, I, I'm waiting. What, well, what, what are you waiting for? Quentin Tarantino said he wanted to put a little blurb too. Yeah, Quentin was going to do it. Did he do it? Yeah. No, he never did. Never did. Quentin, Quentin never did. See, that's why I want to kick his ass. If you, people listen to my radio show, you, you know I challenged him to a bar fight. You know, loser leaves the genre, and I said we have to do it. A darker than amber, William Smith, Rod Taylor, kick ass bar fight. Yeah. So far, the challenge has not been accepted for oh, some reason. Right. We don't we don't do no fighting at Wasteland. So. Well, that gonna be a Wasteland. It's gonna be in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to, to refer to Gary as one of those guys as like the unsung hero of independent film. He, he did whatever they needed to be. Hey. You, you, you didn't even get credited in the in the, the beginning of you know Hell's Bloody uh, uh, Devils we or uh, not Hell's Bloody uh, uh, Angels Wild Women is the, uh, the the odd rape scene uh, second to last yeah yeah and uh, he didn't even get credited for that but it's like you know the movie begins with two guys running down a black girl and raping her okay who That's starts a movie that way anymore <laughs> yeah so but it, but it, you know it's uh, it, it, he was there for whatever they needed stunt work uh, he was a competent actor bit roles any roles you can get you were you were there weren't you I was really fortunate when I got to L A all the actors were out of work and I thought well this isn't for me I got to do something else and I was watching him shoot a Frank Sinatra movie on Gower Boulevard and all of a sudden they said stunt men get to your cars and then these guys looked like gladiators and they went over and stood in front of these automobiles and they said okay stand by action and cars started crashing into each other and people getting in fights and killing each other uh, that's what I want to do so <laughs> shortly after that I was having coffee at an old famous uh, Hollywood pharmacy called Schwab's Pharmacy and a guy said a friend of mine said there's a young actor named Jack Nicholson and he's doing two westerns up in Utah, and they're looking for a stuntman. I said, I'm a stuntman. So they sent me over to uh, the interview with Jack, and that was back when my hair was black and Jack had hair. And he interviewed me, and we just lied to each other. He didn't know what he was doing, I didn't know what I was doing, but he hired me, and that started my career in stunt work. So for years and years and years, I did stunt work. I was rapist number one, or dog number one, or killer number two. Well, when you look at like the, some of the credits on the reel, we run, it's Bob on the beach, rapist one, <laughs> Hitman two, 
But they, they just needed the little role. Now, the, the, of course, the first two films you were involved in, of course, were the Monty Hellman films, right? The Whirlwind. And right, right. Those were the Nicholson films. Yeah. And that, that sort of segues into what we were planning to do because Gary has worked with a lot of, you know, guys that, you know, we look up to. They're grindhouse icons. They're great actors. They're great directors. But unfortunately, a lot of them are no longer with us. And one of the guys who was a huge influence on you, you had said, was Cameron Mitchell. Cameron Mitchell, yeah, I don't know how many of you remember Cameron, but what a great guy Cameron Mitchell was. And uh, he came up, he was on uh, a picture we did called Ride the World when he and Jack Nicholson were the two leads. And I doubled Cameron, I doubled Jack and Cameron on the, did their stunts on the show. And Cameron became a good friend of mine, and Daniel, I didn't know anything about stunts, so I was just faking it. I was falling off horses onto the ground. I didn't know you're supposed to dig them up and lay sand down. I didn't know you're supposed to wear pads. I was just going for it. And Cameron Mitchell was staying at the big hotel with the Daniel Boone Company came up, and they had some of the best stuntmen in the business on that crew. And they needed one more stuntman they didn't want to send back to Hollywood. So Cameron said, I've got a great stuntman. He just falls on the ground. He doesn't use pads or anything. He said, send the kid over. Send him to us. So I went over, and after they made fun of me and humiliated me, they started teaching me the ropes. And that's how I really got started in stunt work. And Cameron was the one that got me that job. Yeah, and an interesting sidebar on Cameron is that there was two spaghetti westerns released in the mid-60s. One was, of course, we all know, Fistful of Dollars. The second one was Minnesota Clay, starring Cameron Mitchell, both released the same year at the same time, and both directed by somebody named Sergio. One was Leon, one was Corbucci. Now, of course, we all know that Fistful of Dollars shot through the roof, and Minnesota Clay went up on a late-night 1 o'clock TV for some reason, but it's still a great film, and Cameron puts in a great performance. And you don't have guys around like that anymore. Another guy that you were tight with, worked with, and hung out with was Warren Oates. Warren Oates, one of the best. Uh, maybe, you know, not too long ago I gave a talk at St. Edward's University. They're graduate senior students at uh, St. Edward's. And I got enough time about Warren Oates, and no one knew who he was. Warren Oates, most of you probably know you, who he you, was. Most of you probably know who Warren Oates is. Well, Warren and I became friends up in Utah on, on those movies. And then we there was a, a bar in Hollywood called the Rain Check Room, a little dive kind of bar, but all the actors hung out there. And I used to go and uh, meet Warren for drinks. We'd meet there and drink. And I just have to tell you this one joke uh, on, on Warren. Warren Oates has, was separated from his wife, Teddy, at the time. And I had another friend named John Jones, a boxer who later became a director. He directed The Forest and he directed Schoolgirls and Chain. But he started, he didn't know Warren and he started dating Teddy Oates, Warren's wife. And I was sitting with Warren and we were having drinks talking about the difficulties his son was having. And Don Jones came in and said, hey, Kent, introduce me. So I introduced him. I said, Warren, here's Don Jones. And he said, oh, you're the guy that's dating my wife. And Jones he went, yeah, and he said, well, that makes you my fucking double, doesn't it? <laughs> wow. Great guy, Warren. Great guy. Surprising to get in a fight, though, Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> well, another guy you used, like, I, I, don't, I, don't think you, I don't know if you worked with him, but you said you hung out with him, was Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin. Yeah, I did not work with Lee, but I drank a lot with him. <laughs> and, and what a guy. Lee, I was working in a bouncer at a, at a club called the Fog Cutter in L.A. And Lee used to always come in. Here he'd come in with a party of people. There'd be seven or eight people, women and men, laughing and joking. And into the place they'd go with Lee. And about 20 minutes later, Lee would come out all by himself and say, I gotta get out of here, get me a cab. So I'd call the cab, and while we were waiting for the cab to come, he'd pull out a flask, and he'd have a drink, and then he'd start handing it to me, and then I'd have a drink, and then pretty soon we'd just get in the back of the cab and go down to the back of the parking lot and sit down there and drink and tell lies and good old stories, but he had a great sense of humor. And another thing about Lee Marvin, everyone said he was a badass and a tough guy, uh, and he was, but he at the same time was one of the politest gentlemen ladies guys I've ever known. Another guy, uh, actually a legit tough guy, uh, you hung out with, doubled and worked with, was Scott Brady. Scott Brady, I love Scott Brady. Um, first film I got to work, first film I ever did was a picture called Battle Flame at uh, Allied Artists. 
and Scott Brady was in it. He was played a lieutenant in the Korean War, and I played a foot soldier along with Bobby Blake. Was Robert Blake was one of the other foot soldiers. But anyway, uh, Scott Brady, the first thing, I idolized Scott Brady, because when I was a kid, I used to go sit in the front row of the theater and watch Scott Brady, this tough guy, and I thought, man, what a great... When I got to Hollywood, everyone said, he's one of the best bar fighters. You don't want to fight Scott Brady. So anyway, I'm sitting on the set and waiting to meet him, and I hear him walking. You could hear his voice a mile away, and he went, Gary Kemp. That's the phoniest name I have ever heard of in my life. Who the hell is he? Well, that was my introduction to Scott Brady. And then I did five films with him, and we became good buddies. Oh, one other thing I want to say about Scott. Some of these guys, that, like Lee and, and Marvin and Scott Brady, and I hung with him, and they were tough guys, but they were also just sweet guys. We had a theater group, and we had a party, and we had, we had a bunch of tiki torches lined up on the way into the party so you could follow, see your way to the party. And we invited Scott to be one of our celebrity guests. Scott came and he got drunk and he had all his Notre Dame buddies with him. And they all stole the sticky tiki torches. So when the party was over, what happened to our torches? And they were gone. The next morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, at my door, and there was Scott. He was returning the tiki torches and said, I apologize, we got a little heavy last night here. That was Scott. Love Scott Brady. For those of you who don't know, Scott Brady and Lawrence Tierney were brothers. And, and Eddie Bunker was telling a story on, I think, a Reservoir Dogs that uh, when he was in and out of jail, he drove by this thing and had to break up a fight. It was Scott Brady and Lawrence Tierney beating the shit at each other in the parking lot behind a bar. Well, they were both notorious tough guys oh, yeah. and drinkers. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Scott had actually been a pro boxer for a while before he went into acting. And he boxed in the service. Yeah, another, another guy who was legitimately tough that you hung out with was Neville Brandt. Neville Brand. Yeah, he was I, a World War hero. I, I have to tell my Neville Brand story. I think I told it last time I was here. You can tell I, it again. I'm, I'm going to tell it again. Uh, there was another tough guy, Bill Smith. I, yeah. I knew all these guys. Bill Smith, Chuck Bale, another tough guy. And I and Neville Brand were on the back lot at Universal, down around the old abandoned buildings. And Neville Brand, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he was a sweet guy, very funny, heavy, heavy drinker. And he had to pee, and it was during the daytime. And so Neville Brand said, excuse me a minute. Unzip me, turned around and started to pee, and all of a sudden, here came a tour bus. Oh, the hell? We're in luck. Here's Neville Brand. Hey, Neville, say hello to everybody. Come on. Hi, how are you? Mothers were grabbing their kids. Fathers were hiding. Yeah, a war hero, Neville Brand. Yeah, he, I, you know, I don't know. He, he, he disputed this. I don't know whether it's true or not. He was supposedly the second highly decorated serviceman out of World War II after Odie Murphy, which he said wasn't true, but everybody says it is true. So I don't. It is true. He was yeah. a very humble guy too. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't want that credit, but time. Uh, and he was always saying, "Gary, remember when you and I we were at the Battle of the Bulge?" So I, I was like three years old. You know. And <laughs> Sorry, Neville. <laughs> And you know, we just saw the first clip that was on this reel was uh, The Thrill Killers, uh, directed by Ray Dennis Steckler, who you did a lot of work for, who was quite a character and actually quite a filmmaker. When you look at, you know, you look at The Thrill Killers and see how it holds up, it's almost like a film noir today. Yeah, yeah, Ray Steckler. Um, strange, Ray Steckler lived across the street from me, and he was one of those guys... I, I, Talk to some of you young guys today that are making your own films, and good for you, because that was Ray. If he had 30 cents, he was going to make a movie. That was it. And he would talk you into working on it, and you'd get $20 and a bologna sandwich, but you were making a movie, you know? And he put all his friends in, and his family, his kids, his wife, and, uh, and we never thought anyone would ever see them. But they did get distributed. They were actually popular in the drive-ins, too. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I knew Ray for, for many years, 20 years plus myself. And finally, he, used, he wouldn't fly. He was afraid to fly. And I uh, uh, finally uh, convinced him to come to Wasteland, and he passed away. Yeah. Ray uh, had cancer, and when he was in the hospital, he didn't want anyone to know. So he would call all of us, all of his old buddies, and say, Hey, we're going to do another film. We're going to be out in the desert. He said, okay, I'll have the bologna sandwiches. We'll go shoot. So, but he was calling from the hospital, and no one knew it. And another notorious figure that you came in contact with was Charles Manson and that whole crew. Yeah. Uh, Charles Manson, for 
those of you who don't know who he was, I think most people probably know <laughs> Charles yeah, Manson. Proud, yeah. There was a ranch, old dilapidated buildings and a lot of acreage outside of L.A. called the Spawn Ranch. And it was used by a lot of movie companies because it had not only had the old buildings and the board sidewalks, but there were no TV antennas or telephone poles around, so you could shoot, you know, without worrying about things looking modern. So, and they had horses that they'd run out. Especially 30s, 40s westerns were shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Owned by a blind guy. Charlie Spawn was blind, blind, the old man. Charlie Manson and his creepy colleague, Crowley, the girls, came out and... They said they would take care of the horses and take care of the place. What actually happened was Charlie had one of the girls with service, if you'll pardon me, old George Spawn, and so he let him stay there for nothing. And they lived in these little shacks up in the hills. And whenever you were shooting there, they would come down and try and beg food from you. You know, can we have your lunch? Can I have that cupcake that you've got there? And we just saw them as these weird, strange little people. Charlie Manson was like five foot six if that, he always barefoot, uh, little skinny guy, and he, to me, uh, he, uh, Bud Cardo's a buddy of mine, was the production manager on a film we were shooting, and we were using his dune buggy as a camera car, and the dune buggy broke down, and I said, gee, we got to use this tomorrow, and Charlie said, well, I'm a mechanic, I'll fix it, so I said, okay, and I looked at him, he's just this little guy, Charlie Manson would never... You didn't see those big hop, hypnotic eyes. He would always look at you like he was a shoplifter. You know, he'd look like this. And he said, I'll fix it, but I need some money. So Bud Cardos gave him 70 bucks. We came back the next day and it hadn't been touched. So I said, give me Charlie Manson. And Charlie came up and I said, Charlie, you better fix that right away or Bud's going to cut you a new asshole real quick. And he did. He got under the hood and fixed it right away. Tex Watson was always wandering around dressed in black, shooting off his guns. And one day we were shooting a film and he came and he was bothering all the, uh, the girls on the set. So Al Adamson was directing. And Al said, Bud, get Tex Watson, get that guy off the set, whoever, he's a nut. So Bud threw him off the set and just picked him up and literally took him to the edge of the set and threw him off in the bushes. About two minutes later, we heard all this gunfire going off over the hill, and it was Tex Watson. He was raging, but he didn't do it to Bud. He did it to a bunch of rabbits or something on the other side of the hill. What film was that? Do you recall the film? Yeah, we did, uh, golly, uh, Girls from Thunder Strip. What was Bud's famous comment when he found out those guns were loaded? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, why didn't somebody tell me those goddamn guns were loaded? <laughs> True. Yeah, well, okay, well, you just brought up Al Adamson. You, you've done, done a ton of stuff for Al Adamson. Al Adamson was like uh, Roger Corman. He and Roger Corman gave more work to guys just getting started, like myself, or guys coming down, like uh, John Carradine, and some of the been surprised people that needed work. And in the Screen Actors Guild, you had to make so much money a year, you didn't get your health benefits. So for a lot of the older guys, they stopped getting films. They'd get a film every two years or something. So Al, they could always call Al, and Al would make sure they made enough money. He'd put them in his phones, and they'd make enough money to get their, uh, their health benefits. Yeah, Ken Taylor and a lot of the old Ken guys. Taylor, sure, a lot, lot of the great guys. Al Adamson was murdered. He did all these very strange movies. Uh, you know, bikers and killers and rapists and strange, strange things. Uh, but he was a very straight guy. Yeah, so. The funny thing about Al Adamson films, well, Al, I, met, I was lucky, fortunate enough to meet Al a couple times myself. He was a tall guy, about 6'6", six, six, maybe. Big hands on him. Nicest guy in the world, like a giant teddy bear. But a lot of times his films started out as one thing, turned into another. He never finished one. It got turned into another film. He, he didn't waste footage. Just, no, Al didn't. Al didn't. He didn't waste footage. And, and I know he called a lot of you guys going, I have two films that are unfinished I need to put together, and now I need you for a scene that will connect these. Right, and half the time there wouldn't be a script. He would just say, okay, I need you to come in here and do something. <laughs> but oh. everybody chuckled. We had the, the scene from uh, Dracula vs. Frankenstein where you're, you're like, I blew a dollar in gas to get down here. <laughs> yeah, no, I had the poor unlucky Bob. <laughs> how, was it, how was it working with Lon Chaney? Because I'm pretty sure that was his last film. You know, uh, a lot of people bum on, on Lon for being alcoholic, but he really was in ill health. 
And I will say this, and he was in very bad health when he, he was the nicest guy in the world. And no matter what the budget or no matter how goofy his part was, he always took it serious and he was very professional. I had to have a special room set aside with a cot in it so he could go between scenes and lie down. But he was always on time and he was always professional. And even if, like in that movie, he just grunts most of the time throughout yeah, the movie. Yeah, he had a hard time talking, you know. Yeah, he yeah. He's like running through his lines, yeah. But he took it very seriously. He also, if I remember right, he wanted to do the fight scene himself with Anthony Isley and thanked him for doing it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was a real pro. Yeah. 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 Well, him and, actually, him and Broderick Crawford were good buddies, and they were notorious for getting nice. They called it when I was a kid, full fighting, where you punch each other out, would actually hurt each other. They were notorious for wrecking dressing rooms. They were good buddies. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Get, these two big bears would just tear apart dressing rooms <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you worked with Broderick Crawford, too. I had to work with Broderick. We always had to stage Broderick Crawford leaning against something, because if not, he would fall over. He was, <laughs> he was usually, you know, eight sheets to win. We had, we had, a, we had a Jack Hill one time. He told a funny story about uh, Lon Chaney, because he, when he did Spider Baby, he said, we kept wondering why, like, you know, he, he just kept eating oranges and eating oranges and eating oranges. We were like, you know, do you, you want a real meal? No, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, what he didn't know is every morning he'd get a bushel of oranges and then he'd slice them open and fill them full of vodka. Right, right, right. <laughs> and just all day long he'd eat oranges so no one knew he was always drinking. There was a great actor, a really nice guy named Adam Rourke, did a lot of the biker movies. He uh, passed away too. Yeah, he passed away too, too soon. But Adam had that same knack of, of shooting up oranges with vodka. And we were all trying to get him to quit drinking. I'll just have an orange, thank you, I brought one. And, yeah. and here he was, straight vodka. Yeah. And he'd go out in the backyard and he would bury a vodka bottle in the backyard and put a little straw sticking up in the bushes. <laughs> and he'd say to his wife, I'm just going to go out and sunbathe. I'll see you a little later, and he would go out and lie there and suck on that straw. He was, he was a great actor, but, wow. he, but he didn't hit 60. <laughs> no, no, he didn't make it. Actually, another, another I, I think, I believe you doubled Bruce Dern at one point. Didn't I you? did double Bruce Dern, yeah. So you had a transplant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Psych Out. I, I doubled him in Psych Out. Bruce Dern was an incredible runner. He almost made the Olympics, but he would run from L.A. to Santa Barbara and back again in one day. That's a long ways. And sprint. A lot, a lot of that distance. They were always casting me where I had to chase Bruce Dern. And he'd go, okay, ready? Go. And Bruce would be gone, and I hadn't even started yet. It was that, that kind of a relationship. Yeah, and, you know, the funny part was Bruce was always, you know, up until, you know, last couple of years, 20 years or so, was always cast as a nutcase psycho thing, but he was actually trained by Lee Straussberg. He was a classically trained actor. And he was one of the the primo drama coaches in Hollywood. Everyone wanted to get in, and so was Adam Rourke. Everyone wanted to get in their classes to study with Bruce or Adam. When the uh, lady you were involved with, actually you had her uh, star in Rainy Day Friends. Uh, she was also starring in another movie we're trying to get here, Welcome to Hard Times, which is just loaded with a cast of character actors, was Janice Rule. Janice Rule, one of my favorite people. Yeah, she... Uh, we could, Janice was in El Health when we cast her in this film I directed called Rainy Day Friends. And I wanted her to feel healthy and look healthy, so I kept saying, act like a man, sit like a man, sit with your legs apart, you know, and put your elbows up on your knees and just have that attitude. And she did it and just gave her, because otherwise she was very frail at that time because she was so sick. But she'd been a raving beauty in her day, Janice, a real nice lady. And all the guys wanted to volunteer to drive Janice home because she would invite them up to her apartment and show them her porno collection. Gee, I wonder if she's one of my old customers. <laughs> maybe so, maybe so. She lived in New York. You, uh, I got written down, you worked with James Arness at one point? Uh, did something with James Arness? I, would, I, I was an electrician on a couple of shows that James Arness did. I didn't know him well except... James Arness and Gregory Peck and some of those guys always showed up by themselves, greeted everybody in the morning, at the end of the day, thanked you, even the guys that made the coffee and the donut, the craft service people. It wasn't like today where they show up with an entourage of bodyguards and paparazzi after. They'd always drive themselves to the studio and they were like really professional, polite people and I miss that. Some of the old guys like John Carradine, too. I mean, yeah. he was a character, but he was always professional. 
Another guy you came into contact with and hung out with was Jack Elam. Yeah, Jack Elam. Remember Jack Elam? I mean, and sure. Yeah, there's another old World War II. Yeah. Regular on Gunsmoke, too. Yeah. Yeah. He was a regular. And the reason he was a regular was because Gunsmoke had the longest running poker game probably in the history of Western civilization. <laughs> and he was Jack. Anybody you ever talked to about Jack that worked with Jack said he was an avid card player and was a good, really good at it. Jack had this, as you know, this one strange eye that just wandered around and it was very hard to talk to him because you try and follow that eye. Right? <laughs> that was actually, it gave him a lot of character when he was, you know, when he, yeah, when he was on the screen too. It was like, give you that look. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It was a story behind that because he, he, he lost that sight of that eye in a childhood fight. He was actually, after he came back from, you know, the war, he was an accountant. And his doctors told him that if you, you know, continue to do this, you're going to lose sight in the other eye. So he cut some kind of deal to do the paperwork for three pictures, and that's how he started. Yeah. And he always wanted to be the heavy. He loved being the heavy. Yeah, he did. He did. And then uh, I believe it was Bert Kennedy who found out that he had a really great underlying sense of humor and a comedic talent. And he stuck him in that uh, support your local sheriff, support your local, yeah, and a bunch of that stuff. And that, you know, toward the end of his career, he was doing a lot of comedy. Like Cannonball Run was a perfect example of that. You know, the guy was a great actor. I mean, just, you know, either as a heavy or as, you know, a foil, he was good. He was another one of Al Adamson's friends who Al and I are. Ken Taylor, Scott Brady, Brock Crawford, yeah. Jack Elam, Ken Curtis. And Angelo Rosito. Angelo Rosito. The world's probably, probably, oh, he was like in, in his 80s when he died. And, you know, midgets really don't live that long, but, you know, the guy was so prolific that, you know, uh, he, he was out with Lugosi, started Freaks, did a bunch of Lugosi stuff in the 40s at PRC stuff, and then when Gary was working for Al, he was a regular there, you know, all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah he had, still, he worked all the way to the day he died, you know, yeah. in the third Mad Max movie. He used to have a uh, paper stand on Hollywood Boulevard, actually, Rosito, and he would sell newspapers, and then when he went home, he had this little suitcase he carried, and he'd get on the bus and put the suitcase down, step on it to get up on the seat. Yeah. He was, actually, he's in, he's in this movie we're showing tonight, Little Cigars, he does a cameo. He's the shortest one in there. And, and a whole cast of midgets, he's the uh, shortest one. I don't one. know, it's either him or Felix. Yeah. And then, of course, Dick Miller. Yeah, I did work with Dick Miller on a picture called Battle's Lane. Well, the one with Scott Brady. Yeah. 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 So, you're getting a lot of offers now, I understand, to do some work. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank God, because I'm too old to do stunts anymore. I did, <laughs> I did a picture called Bubba Hotep. Which, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. I was the stunt coordinator on that, and... We broke for lunch. I'd like to say it was doing a stunt, but we were out at Malibu on the edge of this cliff, and we broke for lunch, and I stepped backward off the cliff and broke my leg, and I thought, I'm getting too old to be doing this stuff anymore, I think. That was that, was that right before you did your first wasteland, because you came in limping. Yeah, yeah, I was on, on crunches then. But uh, luckily, since then, I've been getting a lot of work. I'm doing a film called Frame Switch down in Austin now, a really good film directed by Drew Thomas. And, uh, and then I have a couple more back-to-back -back after that. So I'm back on the boards, guys. Watch out. <laughs> now, if you look back on all the things you did, I mean, you did so many jobs. What, um, personally, what would, your, what, what would be your, like, what would you consider your, your favorite job on a film? Was it actor? Was it stunts? Was it coordinating? Man, all, all of the above. But, but I have to say... Uh, Goldie Hawn once said that the way she judged a movie was the experience she had working on it. And I'm kind of the same way. There were certain movies that you'd work on that were just a pleasure, the entire movie. The things you got to do. Psych Out was one of them. Richard Rush was one of my favorite directors. He directed The Stuntman, Free Me and the Bean, Hell's Angels on Wheels, Psych Out. But I did a picture called Psych Out with um, Jack Nicholson, Bruce Dern, Susan Strasberg. And I got to be, I got to act with Jack, I got to double him, I was the lead heavy, I got to do the special effects and coordinate the stunts all in one movie. So I was just happy as a yeah, pig. So Jack, all this, so you did, no, no real job was better than the other, but you were better when you were busy. Right, right, just being busy and helping get a movie made. I just fell in love with movies, that whole 
And the minute I got behind the camera and saw, because you go to a movie, and you all know this, you see the movie, but you don't see the 40 or 50 other people that help get it made that are behind the camera, the set dressers, the prop people, the electricians, and the work they do is just as exciting to me as being in front of the camera. When you watch a Hollywood, you watch a film you were on, and the entire cast goes blazing by with two minutes. You watch a Hollywood production, it takes... 17 minutes just for the behind the scenes casting. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So There's another that. film you worked on, you had uh, the privilege of working with Boris Karloff and losing your driver's license at the same time for that stunt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. here, this is a good story. Tell, tell that story. Uh, Pat Pafala came by and talked to me today about that movie. It was a picture called Targets by Peter Bogdanovich. This was his first film, first feature film, wasn't it? Second. Okay. It was his second film. He'd done a, a picture for uh, Roger Corman before then called girls from outer space or something a terrible terrible movie but but he directed that that's where i met him and then i was hired on targets to do the special effects i did all the shooting on the on the film for the for the killer and that was my thing i was always the bad guy and um, but on that film boris karloff worked the film and i just idolized boris karloff since i was a kid he was the nicest guy and we'd eat lunch every day and he would tell me about he raised bedlington terriers and championship roses and he was so proud of his dogs and his roses so that was boris karloff but at the same time um, i had to do stunts on the movie and we did when the sniper is shooting at the cars on the freeway at that time you could not shoot on the freeway you still can't because it's dangerous you have to use it freeway that's shut off and no one's on it but we were just sneaking shots whatever we could do and the scene was I had to come driving down uh, first of all I was the guy up on the tower doing the shooting then I'd go down and get in the car and be the guy getting shot and so driving along I'm with Don Jones and I had Don Jones dressed as a woman and we're going along the freeway and the, uh, the gag was we're to get shot and I'm to pull over to the side of the freeway and Jonesy, dressed as a woman, is to get out of the car and go running a few feet and fall down. So we did that. And can you imagine being a regular driver on the freeway and you see this car go over to the side of the road, a woman get out, run a few feet, take a hit and fall down. Everybody called the police. And in two minutes, there were cop cars everywhere. And we said, oh, we're doing a movie. And we looked around and the whole movie crew had disappeared. <laughs> They took our licenses away for six months for that. Wow. <laughs> That's funny. So that movie, like you said, you did the shooting, you did the driving, you were the victim guy who well, we got shot and killed. Right, 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 right. It's like how many times they can utilize you in one scene. It's beyond the, it's sometimes funny, sometimes. That's what I like because I just wanted to work. I didn't want to be one of those guys standing in line forever. And I was lucky enough I could do a few things. And I just got hired again and again and again to do all kinds of stuff. And I loved it. And you, like I said, you know, I, you know, we've we've said this on the radio show before. You know, I like put you you over and Ted Michaels and Stecker, all these guys over because basically Hollywood was choking on itself by the time these guys came around, and they just kicked open the door, tried new stuff, did all kinds of crazy stuff. Of course, Ted Michaels, we all know, you know, all his stuff he's done. He would sit there and wait for an accident to happen and shoot it to use the footage in his next film. You know, all, all kinds of stuff. But if it wasn't for guys like Gary and them. We wouldn't have had, you know, the experiences we did have. And these guys, you know, all their stuff they did was stolen by Hollywood, the majors. Well, that's pretty much it. We always come up here, we come up plenty of times where um, Hollywood's originality was just stolen from independent cinema. And then when, when Hollywood shut down all the drive-ins and the independent theaters, so went their ideas. And that's why you're stuck with an endless series of the shitty sequels of, and shitty remakes of already shitty films. And that's the truth, if you think about it. I mean, they control everything now, so, you know, their, their, went, their, their originality went with the independent cinema. What was so wonderful, and, and Ken knows this as well as anyone, that that period, which really lasted the 60s and 70s and kind of into the 80s, uh, before television, mom and dad went to the drive-in because they could take the kids, and the drive-ins were a big thing. And then television came in, so mom and dad stayed home with the kids, and the drive-ins didn't have any product, and the major studios thought they were above drive-ins. They didn't go, so it left the door wide open for guys like us to come along and do it. And we just decided to hell with the rules. We'll just do stuff our way. And I heard George Clooney 
say he got a, a, a Screen Actors Guild Award a couple years ago, and he got up and said just the same thing you said, that those guys, the independent and the grindhouse cinema, was what really changed film creatively for the better. It's just easy to see if you look at my film collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's proofs on the shelves, you know. Yeah, it's like, like I always said, like the pivotal years, I thought, I thought were like, when, you know, 63 when Blood Feast hit, and that kicked open the door to a lot of other things, and it's just like, when you hit up into the point in Night of the Living Dead, the Wild Bunch in 69, and you just went fucking bonkers from then, and anything went, and just people, you know, people didn't know what to do, because there was so many outlets, the grindhouses and the drive-ins, there was just so much, you know, you could throw so much product through them, be it good, bad, or indifferent, and you know, you really, you know, like Ken and I, you know, we're, we're from... We got 10 years apart, he did the drive-ins out here, I did the grindhouses in Manhattan, stuff like that. But we basically saw the, the same films in just different environments. And of course, we always saw Gary. Not that, you know, back then I knew who he was, because I didn't, because I drank a lot and shit. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know now, you know, first time I came up here, uh, my first panel was Gary and Ted Michaels. And, you know, we've been in touch ever since. He pops up on my show. People just love it. You know, and you don't walk away from an hour conversation with Gary without learning something. And that's what I don't understand about a lot of the conventions is, you know, people just go there for autographs. They don't want to fucking learn anything. No, uh, I get it. We get that here. Uh, yeah. Sometimes people say, well, I, I, don't, I really don't like your guests. So I'm like, but the question I have for you is, do you know the guests? No. Well, then why don't you show up and learn something? You know, what do you mean you don't like them? You want the same generic glob of crap I got to see a dozen other shows here? Or do you like to Get any younger? I grew up loving these films, and it's like you know, man, learn something, will you? Go outside the box of what's playing in your multiplex right now. One of the great things about it was because the independents, you never had a lot of money. They were usually limited budgets, so you really had to figure things out how to do things without having a lot of money, ingenuity, and it just led to all kinds of new inventions and creativity and ways of doing things. It was just a gas to be able to do. And Ted Michaels, you mentioned Ted. How many of you know who Ted Michaels is? <laughs> Ted, oh good, you, you all know Teddy then. Ted. He's been here a few times. Yeah, yeah, he has. One of my favorite people. Uh, two stories I'll tell you real quickly about Ted, if I may. Ted was also a really good cameraman. And there's a picture that when I first got to Hollywood made called The Hostage. It had Harry Dean Stanton starring in it. Ted Michaels was the cameraman on it. They went down to South Dakota to shoot. It was freezing. They were shooting early in the morning. They just had enough money for one stunt, the big money stunt, which was this big truck that was going to come from in the distance, and then it was going to get close to camera and turn over. It was costing like 20 grand or something to get this thing done. And this was the day before walkie-talkies. So down the truck went, way down the road, and Ted comes out, and he's trying to load the camera. And, and the uh, assistant director told the stunt guy driving the truck, the cue for you to bring the truck is, we'll turn on this big light and shine it down your way. And when you see the light, come, come with the car. So he said, okay. And Ted now is trying to load the camera, and it's freezing. And he said, I can't. Turn that light on and put it over here so I can see what I'm doing. And turn the light on. Here came the truck, and everyone's going, no, no. And the guy thought they were saying, go, go. So he floored it truck roll over they didn't get a foot of footage on it and then another time we were doing a picture called the black can clansman in bakersfield we were using a special effects guy called hairbreadth harry or three finger harry and you don't want to use an effects guy called three finger harry uh, especially but if you're blowing something up you're blowing something up right so we had a pickup truck the big ending of the film if you've ever seen that film the big ending was to be this pickup truck with the bad guy in it driving, trying to escape, and he drives into this huge rock and smashes and kills himself, and the rock was supposed to, the truck was supposed to explode. Ted Michaels is directing. We have Hairbreath Harry is going to drive, Three Fingers driving the truck. I said, Three Finger, you better let me do it because I can bail out and no one will get hurt. He said, No, no, I, I'm not going to get in the truck. What I'm going to do is I have it wired so it'll go right into the rock. <laughs> Well, right next to the rock was the Kern River, this big, dark river, just rumbling while we were shooting. So we get all set. This is the money shot again, a Ted Michaels movie. We're out there. Okay, action. Here goes the truck right toward the rock, and it turns and goes right into the river. 
And if you see the movie, that's how it ends. It just goes into the river and that's it. Oh, and Ted ran over. He, caught, he thought Harry was in the truck. And he said, save Harry. Somebody get Harry. And Harry was standing right next to him. So Harry started yelling, get Harry, save Harry. <laughs> I always thought one of Ted's strengths was lighting. He was a great, he'd light a great scene. He, he was in a lot of hurry sometimes, so some of his shots would look rushed, but he always lit them real nice. And yeah, yeah. He was actually a producer on uh, one of my favorite films, was Children Should Play with Dead Things. Oh, and he was a producer on it, uncredited. Jen and I distributed it, and uh, all the graveyard scenes on the island and everything, Ted went and went, My God, man, I can't see anything. So all that was him. He relit all that stuff and made him reshoot it because he was a producer. He was like, I'm not distributing this unless you can see the graveyard scenes. And if you remember that movie, that, that whole island sequence is just wonderful because he lit it right, you know? Yeah, yeah, he was good then. Yeah, here, here's a guy that's like 86 years old. His back is shot. I talked to him you know, on and yeah, off. he can't uh, travel anymore. He can't travel anymore, but he's still as exuberant about making movies as he was when he was 20 years yeah. old. He just loves the, the, the business, and he, he's got like nine projects going whenever you talk to him. No money, but nine projects going. He's even got people shooting Corpse Grinders 3 in Spain now. Do you believe that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, ha I had a pop because the Astro Zombies 4, he had people shooting, you know, footage of, like, famous places all over the world just so he could CG blow them up in his living room. Yeah. Yeah. He once told me that, uh, like, now he's, he's not getting around and his back hurts, but he once told me, he says, well, when I can't get around, I just didn't sit in the backyard and shoot bugs. I'll figure out something to do with them. <laughs> And we want to take some questions from some of you guys. You got, Greg, don't say Django. Now, I think your shirt says that about so. <laughs> <laughs> My question, Gary, we've talked a little bit this weekend, chatted over Facebook, but I'm curious, one thing I, I was curious about, you've done so many stunts and really crazy stuff. Is there anything you've ever really turned down that you saw as being, can't do it, either, either from the stunt man or from a stunt coordinator standpoint? Uh, the only thing I ever changed was a picture called The Forest that uh, a guy named Don Jones, a buddy of mine, directed. And I never turned down a stunt myself. If, if I, it's called family. It must eat kids. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, but directors frequently do not have any idea what the stunt is going to put the dangers involved. They just want you to roll the car 80 times and fall 180 feet whatever and so that's after uh, years and years ago there was a series uh, had an actor in it called Eric Fleming and they went to uh, South America and they were shooting a movie out in the river and Eric Fleming drowned on, on that and the other guys in the boat with him drowned and capsized and they didn't have any stunt coordinators or anyone around and that fostered what's called the stunt coordinator, the guy in charge, which I did a lot of. You're in charge of the safety of the stunt guys, and it's up to you to say whether we can do this or not, or how something's going to be done. And the only time I bumped was with Don Jones on the forest when uh, Tommy Barrett, who was playing the lead woman, and it was to go down this river, and it was full of rapids and full of these big rocks. And I was standing there looking at it and going, no, this doesn't look good to me. And she wasn't that good a swimmer, and I didn't have a stunt woman to double her. And uh, the guy who was standing next to me, who was a local guy, said there had been a lot of people had their brains bashed out trying to go down that same place. But Don was going, this will be a great shot. <laughs> so I said, no, that's not what we're going to do. And we ended up doing, she did a high fall off, off the cliff instead into deep water where there were no rocks or anything. That was the only time I personally said, no, we're not going to do the stunt you want. We'll do something else. And stunt coordinators have that right now. They can stop and shoot. Yeah, well, you're responsible for the crew. The stunt crew is the stunt Absolutely. Absolutely. And still, every year, two or three guys or girls will get, get killed doing stunts. So it's the only job on a movie where you can actually get killed or get hurt pretty bad every time you go to work. I think the record for injuries is the Road Warrior, wasn't it? George Miller's Road yeah. Warrior. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Those guys still holds the record for most wounded stuntmen. Those guys are nuts down there. Oh, I know. Uh, anyone else got a question? Yeah, go right in front. Uh, when you were talking about uh, 
earlier on in your in your career doing stunt work, and you said that like before you got the training and you weren't using pads and stuff. Uh, did you ever sustain any injuries while doing that? Anything that's ever actually like, gone on to like bother you later in life or something? Like, Are you, know, you kidding me? <laughs> 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 yeah. Just about everything. <laughs> the, 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 the one word answer: arthritis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, I've broken my leg twice. I've broken my shoulder once. I had this arm sliced up, double Jack Nicholson on a movie, just sliced my move, my arm open. I was with car dogs on Hells Angels on Wheels. Okay. And I did a bar fight, and I was to get hit off the bar and fall into the glass behind the bar where all the glasses were. And they had real glass there. I'd asked them to put candy glass up, but they didn't put real glass. So when I fell, the glass fell down to the pad in front of me, and I went like this with my arms pulled the pad up, padding up from my arms, and my arms went down on those glass shards sticking up. Cardos drove me to the hospital, and we stopped at a bar on the way. <laughs> we spent about two hours in that bar, and then we finally made it to the hospital. We were so drunk, and we were laughing our asses off. I got on the, on the table, the gurney or whatever it was, and he said, put your arm out on this sleeve. I put my arm and myself out on the sleeve, and the whole thing fell over in the hospital. I remember it as a very happy time. <laughs> It's hardly an injury to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you talk about the bar fight at the beginning of the film? When Jack Nicholson first gets to Yeah, 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 yeah. That big bar fight. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, go, with this, go right there. Out of all the stunts that you've done, if you could pick one that you would consider the most difficult, just from, you know, like the aspect of how am I going to actually do this, what would you pick? Uh... One of the ones I'm the proudest of is the, well, two. One I, one I directed, which was the opening of Rainy Day Friends, a movie I did called Rainy Day Friends, which won the best special stunt in a motion picture uh, at the, stunt, the International Stuntman Awards. And it was the car, the drag where we dragged Isai Morales out on the freeway and dragged him by a trunk. I was really proud of that because it won the award. Uh, then secondly, uh, the time I got hurt the most, actually it was just a goofy little thing where I was playing tennis. It was for a commercial. And afterwards I had to run and jump over the net and I was to get my feet caught in the net and fall on the concrete. But we're in tennis shorts and I couldn't wear pads or anything. And they did 17 takes and I just kept going plop, plop, plop on the concrete. But then the one where I almost bought it was on Psych Out doubling Bruce Dern. We were shooting at the uh, Museum of Art in L.A. and I had to break in to a skylight that was overhead that was two and a half stories up, straight down to concrete, to, not concrete, marble floor down below. And Dick Rush put the camera down there, Lo Leslie Kovacs was shooting camera. And I had to break in and I was supposed to swing, hang, hang from this little lip and swing and then let go and throw myself over a balcony that was about eight feet away. And I thought, well, okay, just looking at it, it looked like I could do it. And so I went up to practice it, really, and I had the grip put a, a little thing that I could hang on with my fingers. And I broke through the skylight, and I'm hanging there, and I suddenly realized, I'm going to go, I'm going to fall, because I can't pull myself back up. So I said, Dick, you better shoot this, roll it, because if I miss, I was going to fall two and a half stories on my head and the camera and everything else. So I was swinging like mad, thinking, I'm not going to make this. And, but I did, and if you see the film, you see I just barely make it over the, over the thing. Um, Schoolgirls and Chains, that character you played, yeah. where did that come from? Because I've always thought that was, and I've talked to you about this before, but I've always thought that was just a very creepy and realistic portrayal of somebody who's got some serious issues. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you later in the room. Uh, actually, I, there, there was a guy in California, you probably remember this, in, in Sequoia National Park, who women kind of thought he was good looking, kind of attractive, but he was very strange, very dark, sort of a barn door kind of a guy, and he worked as a uh, handyman at a motel in, the, in Sequoia Park, and he was the one that killed when they had those series of women being murdered in the park. He was the one doing it, but no one thought it was him because they thought he was just kind of a nice but strange, quiet guy, 
and I would watch him in the movie, I mean in the uh, newsreels of him and say, that there's just something really wrong with that guy. And I sort of fashioned the character after him. Yeah. Schoolgirls is a very creepy film. As you, people, have you seen it? Schoolgirls and Chains, it came out on DVD. Yeah, I saw it. Really kind of creepy film, but it goes back to, it was funny, we had a discussion did another a few weeks ago at another show about just how much the late 60s and 70s was really rapey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, man, and then no one was ever mad about it either. They were like, you know, like, hey, I just got raped. <laughs> <laughs> You're not upset? No, I'm fine. <laughs> they didn't kill me. Then came the new age. Mm -hmm. Weird. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, go ahead. We saw that uh, clip of that, that Tyrannosaurus Rex creature thing. That looked, uh, A, I wonder the name of that movie, it looked great. And B, it was so totally different from everything else in there. That was one million ACDC directed by uh, our my pal. He's been here before, David Hewitt. And uh, yeah. any stories about that one? That one was like a, it was kind of like a bad sex comedy, but so it was written by uh, a fellow notoriously known as Hollywood's worst director, Ed Wood. I, I, I don't know how many of you know his Plan Nine from Outer Space, Glenn and Glenda, a few other movies. Well, he wrote that script, and he wrote it for Gary Graver, who shot, Gary Graver shot that movie. And, uh, yeah, it was Gary Graver, and Gary had a little hand puppet, because there wasn't any budget, you know. So he had this little hand puppet, which was the monster. He'd stick it up over a boulder and go around like that with it. But again, it was just fun. None of us thought it would ever get distributed, but because of Ed Wood notoriety, it did get distributed, and then it became kind of a cult classic sure. of bad cinema. <laughs> well, it was like Mighty Gorga, too. It's right, the Mighty Gorga, was, Mighty Gorga. that was Dave Hewitt. That yeah. was Dave, Dave Hewitt uh, yeah. there, too. I'm I, I, sorry, I, I, my mistake, my bad. No problem. But yeah, that was a, they were fun films, but I, what I find uh, even funnier about them is I just didn't think they would exist. So, so to see them come out now and they get yeah. the DVD is just like, you know, my God, man, who thought that thing would ever exist this long? <laughs> that was shot by uh, one of my favorite people, a guy I just love, Gary Graver. He and I were good friends, and he shot a lot of movies. Bad movies, pornos, A movies. He just worked. All the hardest working guy I ever knew. Gary just Graver. doing his job. Yeah, and he loves you. I'd love to shoot for you, work for you someday. Just play. And Will said, well, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, Give me your number, but I'm leaving on a plane. I don't have time to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. So Gary said, okay, give him his number. And when Gary got home, the phone was ringing. It was Orson Welles. And Orson said, well, maybe, maybe we should get together and talk. Come on over. I'm in Bungalow 3. And Gary couldn't believe it. He was going over to Bungalow 3 to see Orson Welles. And he goes in and he's sitting there talking. And all of a sudden, Orson Welles jumped on him and took him to the floor and sat on top of him and pushed his face down like that. It was down like this. <laughs> Gary thought, what the hell have I got myself into? What's, what's going on here? And he said, quiet, that's Ruth Gordon going by, an actress going by, and if she sees me, she'll talk to me for three and a half days. <laughs> that was Gary's introduction to Orson Welles. <laughs> that's funny. Anyone else? Oh Go ahead, James. Oh, you would, uh, sorry, you, you know you've been working on like, a few of like, Dick Rush's earlier films. Um, did you, I guess sort of a two-part question. Did you have much to do with the Anything to do with the creative process of uh, the stuntman, and if uh, if so, like, what, did you have? Uh, did he talk to you about like like consulting or anything like that when he was writing it? Or when he did the stuntman, unfortunately, I did seven pictures for Richard Rush. He's a dear friend of mine. When he did the stuntman, I was writing and getting ready to direct a picture called The Pyramid, my first movie as a director. So I didn't work the stuntman. All my buddies did. Chuck Bale, who's my best friend, played the stuntman, the lead stuntman in that. Uh, I didn't work it, but after they finished it, he went on tour, and we were doing high falls and things to promote the movie. So I went and and did the high falls to help promote that movie for Richard. But I didn't actually work the film itself. Anyone else? I read your autobiography, which I think is just excellent. There's a story in there about a stuntman, Judo Gene. Yes. If you could retell that to the audience. Uh, stunt guys, Lee Marvin said this, one night they were having a... Uh, 
award ceremony for stuntmen at the Beverly Hills Hotel and all the stuntmen were dressing up and going in tuxedos and stuff and Lee Marvin said if you're out tonight and you see some guy walking around in a tuxedo with a carnation don't make fun of him uh, uh, stunt guys just don't give a shit they're going to go for it no matter what and, and Jean LaBelle Judo Jean LaBelle is probably I know two guys personally there, there are more than that but two guys who really can take on five guys at once and you know all you guys that doesn't happen you see in movies all these guys can beat up all these other guys that's in a real life it doesn't happen that way you get piled on right away and it's over really quickly uh, but I knew a couple of guys that really could that were just that tough one of them was Chuck Bale and the other was Judo Jean LaBelle the toughest man in the world and he's still alive and every once in a while he'll, he's now going to be 80 close to 80 every once in a while he'll still coordinate stunts on a show but uh, Judo Jean will tell you I'm not the toughest guy in the world but I am the handsomest <laughs> and uh, the story I'd like to tell about Judo Jean is there's an actor, and I might as well say his name because everybody that's read the book knows who I'm talking about anyway, Steven Seagal, who <laughs> pretends he's a tough guy, but he's not. He's really a wuss, and he's good at beating up women and small people, but he's not really tough. And he was on a set with uh, Judo Jean LaBelle, who was 71 years old at the time. And Steven Seagal said, there's not a man that can take me. I'm trained in martial arts. I'm this and that. And Judah said, well, I'd like to give it a try. So Stephen Seagal said, okay, and he got ready, and Judah had him down in like less than a minute. And Seagal said, wait, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. He said, okay, well, we'll do it again. He did it again, and this time he choked him out, and the guy pissed his pants. And that's why Stephen Seagal did, and everybody was just applauding. There was just this big ring of water in there. So that was Judah Jean. Thank you for mentioning him. The nice guy, sweetest guy in the world. He used to wrestle too, didn't he? He did wrestle, and then for a while he announced the, the things. Yeah, he, he was at the Olympic Auditorium in, I think, Los Angeles, because I used to get it on the Spanish station. And I would always, once in a while, Judo Gene would come out and just kick somebody's ass, and then you wouldn't see him for six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love that guy. Anyone else? Something? Anything? Oh, here. Uh, Gary, earlier today we mentioned uh, Savage Seven a little bit. Can you uh, tell the audience a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. That's another Richard Rush movie. And on it, uh, that was my big chance. Richard said, okay, you're going to have a major role in this. You're going to play one of the bikers called Rodeo. And he, uh, in fact, the review said part of the brilliance of that film was Richard Rush cast stuntmen as the real bikers. And... Uh, and so he cast me as this part of Rodeo, and I thought, man, I'm going to have all this dialogue. This is going to be wonderful. And we're out on the stunt unit, and I'm riding. We're going down the road, and I'm doing a T. I'm standing on the saddle on the, on the motorcycle, and the actors are behind us. And we're going down the road, about 40 per camera crew behind us. And there was a great stunt guy named uh, Alan Gibbs, great bike rider. For some reason, he'd never done a seat stand, and he jumped up on his seat, and he lost his bike, and it went into mine and knocked it out from under me. And I was going down the road, nothing under me, about 40 miles an hour, and I hit the concrete. I threw my arm in front of me so I wouldn't hurt my head. And I thought, gee, I've made it. I just skinned myself, and I'm coming up, and I'm in a position of like doing push-ups. And Larry Bishop, Joy Bishop's son, ran into me, and he broke all the ribs on this side. And Dick Clark drove me to the hospital in Boulder, Colorado. Went to the hospital and I thought, gee, I'm just fine. Everything's cool and I'm sitting on the gurney. I'm always in hospital sitting on the gurney. I'm sitting on the gurney and all of a sudden I just passed out. And that's when they told me, no, your ribs are broken. You're going to be our guest for a while. Checking you the bar on the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of course he's I, I will tell you this. The, the, the guys that came to visit me first when I was in the hospital were other guys that were on the movie. Adam Rourke, yeah. Dwayne Eddy, a great guitarist, yeah. great guitar guy. If you've got John Garwood. And they brought this lit of grass into the hospital. And they said, come on, let's light up in this... You'll, let's just do it because we can do it. So we did. And the room and everyone reeked. So they left, and I could hear them singing and going down the hall. And pretty soon, I'm lying there, just feeling pretty mellow. And this woman walked in, one of dressed as a nurse, and she said, "Are you ready for your massage?" And I said, "Massage? What massage?" And she said, "Well, here, I'm going to give you a little tone up." And she pulled down my trousers. I, you know, I'm lying in bed, and I went, 
what the heck? And she started reaching for my, this is a true story, my private parts. And I, this is, what, what is going on here? Don't do that. I can't do anything. I, I was so high, I was, you know, I was on Perkadan too, so I'm just, just <laughs> up on the ceiling. Well, Adam and Dwayne and all the guys had hired a hooker. They were <laughs> <laughs> sitting there going, gosh, you get injured more often. Right, 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 right. I, love, really? I love the bedside man. <laughs> Time for one more. What, you got another one? Go ahead. Uh, earlier, you uh, mentioned working on Hotel. Uh, is there anything you'd like to share about the Hoskey Davis? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you, well, when you worked on uh, Bubba Hotep, did you run into or get to talk with Ossie Davis? Oh, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, I did. What a gentleman. What a great guy. Another guy that drove himself to the set, and I think Ossie was about 80 or 81 at the time. For those of you who don't know Ossie Davis, he was just a classic actor who helped break Broadway open for black actors at the time. With Ruby Dee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His son is Guy Davis, the blues guy? Yes, yes, yes. Ossie Davis, great guy and what a gentleman. And he would drive himself to the set and again say hello to everybody and thank him at the end of the day and shake hands with everybody on the crew. He was just an ultimate pro, nice guy. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, Pete, uh, wrap, anything to wrap things up? Well, I'm just glad Gary got out here. I'm glad we could bring him out here. And, uh, you know, a man's an icon in my eyes. If, uh, you know, it wasn't for him and a bunch of other guys, we wouldn't have, you know, the whole 30-year experience of the whole Grindhouse thing. So, Gary, thanks for everything, man. It's a pleasure to forward to my career. Thank, Thank all of you. Thank you. These are the kind of guys I like to, to introduce you kind of fans to. Um, and so it's all, yeah, it's all, <laughs> and, and if you get the chance, read the book. The book is excellent. There's so many bad books being written now, and ghost written now, and Gary's was not ghost written. It, it's his recollections, and, he, and, and, and some of them are so funny he couldn't have been drunk all the time because he remembered a lot of them. <laughs>